أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين uh, Well, الحمد لله Thank you very much for joining today and uh, uh, we are starting our uh, research forum number 14 and I would like to invite Dr. Zaid Barzanji just to uh, initiate it and uh, let's uh, start uh, the session today السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلوات وأتم التسليم على الحبيب المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين I would like to welcome all of you uh, today to this uh, special session with Dr. Ildus Rafikov uh, Alhamdulillah Dr. Ildus Rafikov and I go back uh, close to 30 years uh, to our days at the International Islamic University. And from that time until now, alhamdulillah, has been a great journey. It has, it has been a great a blessing uh, to have uh, and to know him uh, as a friend, as a brother, and as a, a co-worker, and uh, as a, a, a person who is carrying the mission of the Maqasid Institute uh, at, uh, you know, uh, throughout the world. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, Dr. Ildu Safiqoz is uh, a great example of a transdisciplinary scholar uh, with a background uh, from uh, mechanics to communications to Islamic banking and transactions to uh, deep diving into the philosophy behind uh, our contemporary sciences uh, and especially economics. And he's a person who has been trained by a number of great scholars, uh, especially in the field of Islamic economics, as well as finance, uh, alhamdulillah. So he brings a wealth of uh, this information, as well as has this uh, wonderful global uh, perspective uh, on uh, global affairs. And uh, he has been in many different parts of the, of the world and has seen, mashallah, the condition of Muslims. Uh, in these uh, countries, and uh, above all, uh, alhamdulillah, he is a person who is, uh, I believe and I trust, uh, is sincere uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, uh, and is working hard to find uh, a solution uh, and a way forward for all of us, uh, a way that is inspired by the revelation of the Quran Kareem and the Sunnah of the beloved Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, and today, uh, we will have the pleasure to uh, listen to him and interact uh, with him, inshallah, in this program uh, about the, you know, how we are trying to reimagine economics and finance uh, in this and the study of uh, the economic, uh, the study of economic phenomena, which is uh, the initiative that the Maqasid Institute under the Reimagining Economics and Finance Program is trying to uh, is working on actively. Uh, with that, uh, I would inshallah invite uh, Brother uh, Dr. Indus to go ahead and proceed with his presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaid, uh, my brother, for uh, this introduction. Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, and uh, I thank everyone for joining this session uh, today, uh, for some of you this morning. Uh, for some of you, it might be it's uh, it might be night already. Uh, it's a lovely afternoon here in Istanbul. I live here in uh, in Turkey in Istanbul, and uh, uh, of course, uh, also I would uh, I would like to thank specifically our team members. Uh, well, starting from uh, Dr. Zaid uh, himself, and uh, also our team members and uh, our supporter and sponsor. Uh, brother Yasser Hassan uh, from uh, from the UK, and also our uh, sister Amreen Sultan, uh, who is the uh, Indian national, but she is at IIUM Malaysia. Uh, she's a PhD candidate. And so um, the topic uh, the topic for today is uh, something that is uh, we uh, we started several months ago, and. Uh, we were thinking about how to, because we are uh, part of a bigger uh, project of uh, re-envisioning Islamic scholarship. And we've been thinking what are the areas that we can uh, actually re-envision. And there are, uh, there are many, and uh, we will talk about them. 
And so one of the areas, because uh, myself and Dr. Zayt, we are in this uh, area of economics and we've been uh, exposed to economics and uh, banking and finance. Uh, so we decided to look into, uh, into this uh, specific area. And uh, uh, what we thought is, uh, let's try and uh, reimagine it. And uh, this is where we uh, designed the course and uh, we uh, invited uh, the sponsorship, we invited uh, the students and we went through this course. And uh, this is uh, what I'm going to share with you, just a few ideas. It's, uh, it, uh, it is a work in progress and it's not only my work, it's a, uh, you know, it's a collective uh, work, collective each to help of, uh, not only people in in our uh, in our team, but uh, uh, hopefully of everyone in the uh, in the groups that we have started. Uh, and so the uh, the topic of uh, re uh, reimagining uh, economics. So just let me uh, start. Let me share the uh, screen. This is what we are uh, trying to do. We are trying to reimagine and. Uh, uh, you know, I've been uh, in uh, in the area. Actually, let me start uh, very uh, maybe uh, more than thirty years ago. Just this year, exactly this year is uh, has been thirty years since I uh, kind of reverted or uh, you know started uh, understood what Islam is. I accepted uh, Islam, and I started uh, practicing it. Uh, so this year is exactly 30 years, and uh, I, alhamdulillah, I was uh, accepted to study at the International Islamic University in Malaysia in uh, 1995. And so I uh, I studied there, and I did my undergraduate uh, at IIUM in the field of uh, mass communications, uh, 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 specializing in public public relations. And then afterwards, I, I worked uh, uh, in uh, in various companies. I started uh, various companies, but also uh, in in Malaysia. Uh, but also, I did uh, uh, a certified Islamic finance professional, uh, CIFP. It's a master's equivalent from uh, from the uh, from INSEF, uh, International Center for Edu for Education and Islamic Finance, which is uh, located in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, after that, uh, and also before that, I worked uh, for a while as a, as a trader in Forex, in Forex markets. So uh, about two years, I, uh, that was my stint in, uh, in financial markets. And while there, uh, I looked at uh, many arguments, uh, you know, while trading, I looked at uh, many arguments uh, uh, for and against uh, Forex trading. And I actually uh, experienced it myself, and I saw a lot of problems, and uh, I had a lot of questions in uh, in uh, you know in the practice of uh, forex. Even uh, even though there were a lot of talks about the Islamic so-called Islamic uh, forex, uh, you know, if uh, if you just do it daily trading, then it is fine, uh, you, you know. And uh, uh, but uh, the whole uh, uh, the only experience was, uh, alhamdulillah, it was good for me to, uh, because it prompted me to ask a lot of questions about uh, about the whole industry, about the financial industry, and also about the, uh, the Islamic economics, uh, Islamic approaches to finance and banking. And so uh, this is where I started uh, doing the uh, CIFP uh, course at NC. And then uh, that was not, uh, I think, sufficient for me. And then, uh, you know, I started asking more and more questions. And one of the things actually that uh, came up and uh, really affected me a lot was uh, this book. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. The, uh, you know, Makassar Sharia's Philosophy of Islamic Law uh, by uh, Professor Jess Roda. And alhamdulillah, I, uh, after many years, we, uh, I, uh, reconnected with Dr. Zaid and he invited me to join the Mokhasset Institute. And here uh, we were, uh, you know, working side by side with uh, Projasa. Uh, you know, subhanAllah for me, it was a really uh, great blessing. I'm uh, really grateful for uh, the team and uh, and also the uh, uh, Professor Jasser Wood himself. Uh, so because uh, through the Makassar methodology and through the ideas that I've encountered uh, uh, by reading the books of uh, Sheikh Jassan and also through our internal discussions at uh, Makassar Institute, 
I've seen a lot of, uh, I've actually answered, I've uh, received a lot of answers to the questions that I had. And uh, also it provided me, uh, uh, you know, a better understanding of uh, some the philosophy and the methodology behind uh, the uh, Islamic uh, studies, Islamic economics and finance. And so what we are, what I'm going to do is uh, today I'll talk about, uh, you know, what to reimagine. Uh, why do we need to reimagine it and uh, and how to? So the uh, and lastly, I'll just uh, show what are the I mean my personal understanding and my personal view and reading uh, reading of the uh, Quran uh, in trying to understand uh, some uh, some concepts, some pertinent and very important questions uh, or the concepts uh, from Al Quran and Karim. Um, uh, and so. I will start with this, uh, and I really like uh, starting uh, my uh, my talks with the uh, with the quote from the Quran, and uh, this one is uh, from Surah Ibrahim, Al-Bulaim Shaitan Rajim. Alantara kaifa darab Allah mafalil lik kalima tan tayyibat tan kashajari tan tayyiba fasluha thabitu wa faraha fi sama tu'tilu kulaha kulla hainin bi'ithni rabbiha wa yadrib Allah al-amthala lil nas al-allahum yatadakkar uh, so this is a, a great example of uh, of holistic viewing, holistic uh, being, you know, of holistic worldview of uh, of nature. Uh, so something that is uh, very well grounded, uh, a tree, uh, a good tree. Uh, here the example of a good tree, which is well grounded, uh, the with roots uh, going uh, going deep. And uh, so this this kind of tree is uh, uh, it is able to uh, give its uh, give the fruit with the permission of Allah, of course, uh, to give its fruits all the time. And uh, and so this is uh, this is something for us to uh, also to think about, and uh, and uh, also compare with the with a good with a bad tree, uh, you know, something that is. Uh, whose uh, roots are shallow, it doesn't bring any anything good, and it's about to fall. So the fundamentals are important. Uh, now another another example to to support that is uh, also as a trader uh, and maybe uh, maybe some of you have who have been uh, in trading business in financial markets you would know that there is uh, a fundamental analysis and there is technical analysis. And so uh, there have been uh, studies and research uh, done uh, in terms of which one is more uh, which one is more beneficial and profitable. And so what has been found is that in the in the long run, uh, fundamental analysis is uh, much uh, better. At least you know uh, it, it is much better. It brings uh, more uh, profit and. Uh, so, uh, and technical analysis is, uh, again, is something that you always look at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, at the price movements. Uh, it can be at, at different levels. You can, you can look at those uh, levels uh, at the, uh, you know, by year, by, uh, by day, by week, by hour, by minute, even by seconds. Uh, and so based on, uh, based on that analysis of the price movement, uh, you know, you can you can uh, make your uh, so-called predictions, and place your targets. You know, you can uh, you can uh, you want to stop at this price, or you want to you want to uh, sell at this price, or buy at this price. Uh, so uh, even even in that uh, sense, uh, even though I myself I uh, really. Uh, you know, have some negative uh, uh, negative connotation or ne uh, negative experience uh, of, uh, of trading in financial markets. But I see that uh, uh, fundamental analysis is al always uh, always better, always winning uh, in the long term. You know, in the long term. Now, uh, what to reimagine? There has been a movement of uh, reimagining uh, or uh, rethinking or envisioning. Uh, economics uh, for a long time, and uh, you know every time there is a financial crisis or economic crisis, uh, uh, students, especially university students and uh, and, uh, and many professors uh, in economics and in other in, uh, other areas, 
they start to question, uh, you know, why does this happen and why we you know, didn't see it, uh, why we didn't see it coming, despite all of the, uh, uh, you know, all of the tools and all of the uh, our abilities uh, in uh, in analysis, and uh, and all of the tools that are the uh, uh, modern uh, economic economic analysis provides. Uh, still, many economists and uh, uh, they couldn't see, let's say, the 2008 uh, financial crisis. Uh, but of course, some have uh, have seen them. And so, every time something like this happens, uh, people start questioning, and uh, and they start to uh, look for alternatives. They start to look for uh, ways to uh, to do something in order to address those uh, those questions. And uh, so we uh, look at uh, economics as something uh, very important in this sense that uh, it gives us an opportunity to really look at uh, at the world around us and how economics and uh, economic thinking and economic analysis and the uh, and economic policies specifically how it affects the uh, societies. And so uh, every time this happens, uh, people are looking to. Uh, people are looking for some way of, uh, you know, paradigm shift. Uh, and in in our uh, institute, we are looking at the uh, Makassit Institute. We are looking at uh, studying, uh, uh, actually shifting our view from disciplinary analysis to phenomena, uh, to phenomena studies. And uh, uh, what we mean by that is uh, basically transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary view of uh, phenomena of something that happens in real life. Uh, we, uh, even though uh, from within the disciplines, we can still uh, define certain phenomena, uh, but they are going to be, uh, this phenomena are going to be defined within that paradigm, within the paradigm, uh, let's say today, how we look at, uh, at inflation is going to be defined only by, uh, by the neoclassical kind of view uh, of, uh, of this uh, phenomenon. Even though the uh, the phenomenon of uh, let's say of inflation is not uh, is not per se is not an economic uh, 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 is not a purely uh, economic issue, uh, it is an issue of uh, society of policy of psychology of people, and uh, even here in uh, you know I've been living in Turkey for the last three uh, yeah, three years. And what I see is that uh, people, uh, the the inflation is uh, being uh, fed not only uh, be, not only because of the policy of the government, uh, but also by the uh, uh, by the psychology of people, by behavior of people. Uh, when uh, when they see that uh, you know they they want to uh, they want to benefit from the rise of prices and uh, you know. Uh, beat, uh, beat the rising prices somehow, and so they are involved in this, uh, you know, in, in this circle, you know, they uh, continuing circle, and so uh, these are phenomena which uh, which need to be looked in in my understanding, uh, which need to be looked from a really different perspective, and uh, uh, and uh, actually the Quran and Karim uh, provides. Uh, this kind of, uh, you know, the like top-down view that uh, the uh, the approach uh, from the uh, from the revelation uh, that we can look at things and try to understand and uh, uh, understand and uh, to try to envision uh, a life uh, which is uh, better. Now, uh, let us look at uh, very quickly at the uh, this definition. Uh, so here I just I'm just giving the uh, Alfred Marshall's definition uh, in his uh, very influential uh, textbook uh, Principles of Economics, and uh, it is in the uh, in the book one. Uh, it's in the preliminary survey, and here he gives uh, uh, I think one of the best uh, uh, one of the best definitions of economics. Uh, that, that by saying that it's a study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. Uh, it examines that part of the individual and social action, which is most closely connected with the attainment and with the use of material requisites of well-being. So uh, here we see two key, uh, two key uh, parts uh, in, his, uh, in his definition. Uh, number one is uh, ordinary business of life. So uh, he looks at, uh, uh, he looks at uh, the... Uh, uh, the human life 
in its uh, like normal, uh, ordinary or normal uh, how we conduct ourselves. But then in connection with the uh, with material requisites of, uh, of well-being. Uh, so, but then, of course, then uh, he develops into a more uh, specific uh, analysis. Uh, and this is where marginalism comes in and, uh, and uh, all the other uh, views of, uh, of neoclassical economics. So it starts, uh, it starts basically uh, from him and also from, uh, from people uh, of this, uh, of that era. So, uh, and this is uh, specific. And then of course it, uh, it develops even more and uh, it, uh, the uh, economics uh, looks at uh, the issue of scarcity. Even uh, let's say if, uh, if uh, the classical political economics, uh, they looked at the uh, study of wealth and uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Alfred Marshall also looked at the study of wealth. But then uh, from the 20th century, we see how it changed into the uh, study of uh, scarcity, you know, and uh, opportunity cost and, uh, and everything that is related uh, to it and competition and, uh, and everything. And so uh, here we gave uh, a kind of alternative view from, uh, you know, the economic phenomena. When we talk about uh, economic phenomena, what do we mean by that? And so basically uh, what we mean is that these are complex multifaceted processes and interactions encompassing a dynamic interplay of religious, social, cultural, environmental, and technological factors shaping the production, distribution, and consumption of resources within and across life systems. Uh, and all of this is uh, in connection uh, because we are uh, directly connected to the last one out and we're dependent on, on a lot. And uh, I, will, I will mention so, some of these dependencies. And, uh, and we are also connected with the natural environment and we are inter, interdependent with, uh, with the natural environment. And the purpose of it, uh, we can say, is uh, well, also well-being. Uh, or we can also uh, 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 put it as a higher uh, so something, uh, something well, uh, well-being or something good uh, for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. So it is a complex, it's very uh, complex uh, process. And uh, there are many, uh, many elements, many factors I play at the same time. Uh, and it's a very dynamic process. And uh, so we need to understand this kind of environment. But then it's very difficult. It's very difficult to understand it uh, from a purely secular, uh, from purely secular perspective. We can, we can do that. We can look at different, uh, the different aspects of these relations, of the social relations, and uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, analyze them and use certain uh, you know, positive, uh, you know, we can use empirical knowledge, we can use uh, observation and so on, but it's going to be, uh, again, it's going to be deficient. The analysis of uh, social, uh, social relations and our relations with the environment and, uh, uh, and also with the last one, uh, it cannot be uh, fully done with uh, purely empirical, uh, empirical tools or purely uh, observational tools, or uh, it, it also cannot be addressed only uh, through a uh, binary kind of co cause and effect uh, logic. And so this is where, uh, you know, dynamic uh, systems kind of uh, thinking or webs, uh, uh, you know, network, network thinking uh, can, be, uh, can be instrumental in, uh, in understanding that. Now, uh, I want to quote this, uh, uh, this uh, from uh, uh, Professor Masoud al and uh, from his 2018 paper, uh, where he writes about Tahidi uh, Islamic economics in reference to the methodology arising from the Quran and Sunnah. And he actually writes about the, uh, the holistic transdisciplinary uh, view or methodology. You know, if you read the paper, it's, uh, you know, it's free, you can download it. Uh, and this is where he writes that the, uh, the term Islamic economics is an imitation of contemporary intellectual fashion. Uh, it reflects the classification of educational disciplines left to us by the Occidental world, uh, which includes the, uh, I think, the, the, Greek, uh, the Greek classification of sciences. 
And such classification is devoid of the integrated beginnings of intellectual thought in which all Muslim scholars once emerged themselves uh, in the search for knowledge. Uh, their search was not confined to this or that discipline, but was rather conducted with an understanding that placed all disciplines with, uh, within a comprehensive methodological worldview. So this is uh, uh, another uh, kind of con uh, maybe a confirmation from one more scholar uh, who uh, also studied uh, the economics and uh, you know he uh, identified some of the uh, some of the problems in contemporary uh, economics, including Islamic economics as well. And so uh, he and also many, uh, many other scholars, they uh, kind of look at, they're trying to look at uh, economics in a, uh, in a holistic way. But then if we, uh, if we accept uh, the me methodology of uh, you know, classical economics or maybe uh, we accept uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, purely, um, uh, purely empirical uh, view of of the economy and, and the study of the of economies uh, and the policies and uh, conduct our analysis only through uh, the uh, uh, only through empirical tools, then it's going to be uh, deficient. And one of the things that uh, I think is also important in uh, in this sense, is uh, the view that uh, Kurt Gödel, uh, Kurt Gödel, who, <clears throat> who talked about uh, the, uh, I mean, he developed the incompleteness theorem, uh, and in that theorem, he, uh, the incompleteness theorem, he talks about the uh, that any formal system uh, is incomplete. So the, that system cannot explain itself. And so you need something from outside in order to, to explain it. And so uh, epistemologically speaking, uh, every time that we, uh, you know, we uh, try to uh, uh, defend and justify something uh, uh, within, within a system that we need to bring another system. And uh, if, uh, if, that, uh, uh, if that logic is still uh, kind of, uh, uh, the devoid of uh, revealed knowledge, then still we need to bring some more and more evidence, uh, you know, and we can uh, go on uh, forever. But then uh, we can stop at some time and uh, at uh, some point and we need to see what is the uh, foundation, what uh, what kind of foundation can we uh, can we and should we ex uh, accept as uh, as believing Muslims. And uh, why do we need to reimagine that? Of course, there, there have been a lot of uh, a lot of writings, uh, and uh, not less. Uh, I think uh, not the least of the writings, and I think one of the best books in uh, in uh, debunking economics. I mean, the, the book itself is called Debunking Economics by uh, Professor Steve Keen. Uh, actually, it uh, talks about all the uh, all the uh, aspects of the uh, neoclassical economics or the uh, conventional mainstreaming economics that we have today. Uh, and so a lot have, has been written. So uh, I think uh, we can we can accept that uh, there, are, there are a lot of problems, uh, philosophical problems, uh, logical problems, and the problems with uh, assumptions in the uh, in the economics. Uh, but Islamic economics as a discipline also suffers from uh, some ambiguities and con uh, contradicting uh, paradigms. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, if you look at the uh, textbooks on economics, then you'll see that the beginning, uh, uh, let's say, if you refer to uh, an economics uh, textbook, an Islamic economics textbook by uh, by Isra, I think, uh, published in Malaysia, uh, it's an excellent, uh, I think, one of the best textbooks on uh, on Islamic economics. And it starts with uh, with a nice uh, few chapters on uh, on the philosophy uh, of Islamic economics, but then it just continues when it comes to microeconomics and macroeconomics. It uh, it takes a kind of uh, you know conventional uh, look at it. So uh, again, I mean uh, there are some contradicting paradigms that we are trying to fit uh, fit into each other. So, uh, but it, and it is it is kind of problematic. And then uh, disciplinary definition of certain phenomena are often at odds with uh, lived reality. And uh, one of the things, again, uh, uh, we can take a look at the uh, at that, uh, book, uh, at the textbook on Islamic economics is the idea of uh, money. 
uh, you know, and the the nature of money and also the idea of uh, monetary uh, monetary policy, monetary economics. <clears throat> and there are, uh, one of the uh, and also the uh, of course related to it is uh, is banking and and finance and the nature of uh, money today. And we see a lot of uh, uh, scholars, a lot of professors uh, teaching Islamic economics with a view that, uh, uh, you know, first of all, the money was born out of uh, necessity to replace uh, barter. And secondly, the uh, nature of money today is that uh, uh, it is born out of the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the fractional reserve uh, banking system and the money multiplier uh, idea. Uh, even though it has been, uh, uh, you know, it has been re refuted by many scholars, and uh, now many uh, uh, scholars also in uh, in uh, in conventional economics field they uh, they talk about and even even the bankers the bankers themselves they say that uh, you know we uh, we produce uh, I mean banks uh, produce uh, money ex nihilo <clears throat> out of nothing. So and a lot of uh, the uh, uh, a lot of empirical studies have been produced in that area. One of those uh, uh, one of those works I think you can find is by um, uh, Professor Richard Werner and also many other like uh, I think Stephen Keen also he has uh, those uh, the similar ideas and many others and uh, also among the Islamic uh, Muslim uh, economists. Uh, uh, Prof. Naidin Mira from uh, from Malaysia. Uh, he also uh, talks about <clears throat> talks about that. And uh, and lastly, uh, here uh, the Quranic definitions carry uh, carry authority. And I'm I'm going to talk about it just uh, in, in in the next next slide. Now, uh, very quickly, here are the uh, sources of acquisition and processing of knowledge. So all of us, we have this five senses. We have uh, this is where we acquire knowledge. Uh, we read, we hear, we uh, we see uh, something with uh, you know with our eyes, and we uh, you know we have those uh, senses. And then we have introspection, the, the something that we uh, we have the self consciousness. We understand uh, something about ourselves. We understand pain and love and depression and happiness. We understand what what is happening to us at the at the moment. And then, of course, we have uh, memory and we have uh, reason or happen. And uh, the intuition uh, intuition is something that uh, it's a kind of insight, an instant insight without uh, conscious effort. And then we have uh, experience. And lastly, and um, most importantly is the testimony or the authoritative source. This is, uh, I think this is the most uh, important uh, part in, uh, you know, something that uh, uh, because of the differences uh, among people, because of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, who accepts what authority, because of that we uh, Muslims and actually not only Muslims, the humanity, we uh, kind of we go to war with each other. We get into conflict. We, uh, you know, we uh, we uh, excommunicate, uh, you know, each other. Uh, so uh, uh, we call someone kafir. We call someone uh, munafiq just uh, because of, uh, you know, what authority uh, does he or she uh, accept? So uh, this is important because we uh, by this one we would. Uh, uh, we would argue. Someone would uh, argue that my uh, my authoritative source is, uh, let's say, and uh, so and so sheikh, or my authoritative source is uh, hadith or this uh, this kind of hadith or the uh, the amal uh, ahlu Medina, and so on, or uh, al Quran al Karim, uh, or empirical or just observation. So uh, what we take as an author an authoritative source, it it is very important. Uh, here in uh, uh, you know in defining what is uh, exactly and maybe uh, trying to agree uh, between uh, believing Muslims what constitutes an authoritative source and I uh, posit it to you that uh, it it must be uh, the uh, the revealed uh, book Al Quran Al Karim and uh, also the Sunnah which is an explainer <clears throat> an explainer of the uh, of the Quran 
even though in uh, <clears throat> in uh, in in the tradition uh, there are some uh, uh, there are some views uh, that uh, even put the uh, Al Quran subservient to the uh, to the Sunnah, as if uh, Sunnah is uh, higher in authority uh, than the Quran. I mean, there are views like this. Uh, and actually, I just uh, heard this from. Uh, if you look, uh, if you uh, watch the watch and uh, uh, listen to the podcast, uh, recent post at that uh, podcast that uh, Thinking Muslim uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Brown, uh, who explained about the hadith and uh, you know what is what a hadith, what it is, how to understand them. Uh, and so, uh, according to him, there are many scholars who actually. Uh, made the Sunnah my, uh, much higher than than the Quran, and so uh, why I'm stressing on this is that uh, this part is something that really uh, makes us, uh, you know, differ. And this is something that we uh, fight over. We uh, we got into into conflict uh, with each other, and so on. But if we uh, if we accept and if we agree on uh, on maybe one authoritative source. Maybe we can agree on some on some other things. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's see uh, whether we can whether we can agree on that or not. So uh, to continue, uh, and by the way, this uh, this authoritative source it is also a, uh, a result of our uh, you know what we accept as as a testimony. It is a result of our. Um, experience it is a result of our background educational background and so on and uh, basically it is a part of, of the world view it's a belief system it's a point of view about the world of an um, individual or society it is akida it is faith it's paradigm uh, and um, the structure of it is that it consists of uh, knowledge uh, the ideas and principles that we carry and we develop them uh, throughout our life and uh, the beliefs and ideals and spirit and also values uh, that we that we carry, and these are developed gradually. And these are again the worldview is not something fixed. Fixed. It's something. Uh, it is very dynamic, and so it can change. Uh, and something uh, just like uh, just like the qalb, uh, you know, qalb is something that uh, you call it. You know, it it moves. It it can change, and so that's why the Prophet Sallallahu he even made the dua. Uh, so it, it is something that uh, that can change and uh, you know we need to uh, fix and really look at the idea of worldview and uh, look very seriously into it and see how we can uh, uh, what can actually make it uh, you know at least fix or you know so that it's uh, so that it is closer to the uh, fitra of Allah uh, fitra that uh, we are uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, brought with. Uh, so, what does the worldview affect? Uh, it basically, it affects our emotions, our feelings, uh, the formation of thought, uh, the representation of the world to our tasawwur. Uh, it uh, affects our uh, comprehension, our the idrak. Uh, and uh, comprehension of the world around us. So uh, the, the way that we see something, that we understand something, uh, and also the attitude towards uh, people and events, and uh, also uh, it affects our decision-making. And so the, the in terms of uh, comprehension, why do we see it is because, uh, for example, the, uh, the farming, uh, it is important, uh, farming is important for societies, but then, uh, as a as a uh, worldview of a of an urban of a, uh, someone who has been brought up in uh, in in a purely urban society has never seen uh, uh, how potatoes grow or how uh, wheat grows on uh, you know the fruits and vegetables how they grow and how much effort you put you have your support uh, how much effort you put into growing this stuff and harvesting and, you know, bringing it to the market, uh, the uh, appreciation and comprehension of uh, farming uh, will be much lower than uh, the person who, uh, you know, had the, all his or her life uh, was living in a farm and working working in a farm. So it's important to, to understand this, uh, some of these uh, differences, how we 
uh, how world affects the thought, the feelings, comprehension, and uh, tasawwur. And there are many types of worldviews. Uh, if you look at uh, some secular, uh, some secular sources, uh, they would, uh, uh, especially those who propose, uh, uh, those who follow the idea of unilineal development of civilization, uh, from barbaric to the uh, to developed ones uh, to what we have today. Uh, they would start with a mythological worldview, you know, as bar barbarians. Uh, you know, they uh, they would just uh, look at the stars. They would look at uh, uh, some things that are unexplainable, and they start to develop some myths in order to uh, to uh, explain them. And as the humanity develops, they would uh, develop some uh, religious religious beliefs, uh, and then as they develop even further, they will uh, uh, you know discard religion, and then uh, they will go f further up into philosophy. And lastly, into the uh, scientific. And so today it would be uh, more like a, a scientific, uh, technological kind of worldview. But then it is, uh, it is kind of secular uh, view of, uh, of this worldview. Uh, there is attitudinal, I mean, our, uh, our attitudes toward our behavior in the market behavior in terms of uh, uh, like decision making, how we, uh, our behavior towards people and events. And uh, of course, ideological, and uh, uh, the Islamic worldview would be uh, would be different uh, from uh, from all of this. Even though it is religious, but then it is going to be this. Uh, it may be it may encompass uh, some wisdoms. Uh, it is kind of philosophical. It will encompass also the um, uh, observations and some scientific uh, views. Uh, so it is a uh, holistic uh, Islamic worldview is a uh, holistic worldview. And uh, so the factors that shape the worldview are uh, personal experiences, the level of education, the values and ethics uh, that we go through and then uh, that we acquire throughout the, our lives. And the relationships uh, can also, uh, 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 relationships that, uh, can, can also affect our worldview, uh, culture and tradition and religion. Uh, all the health and wellness, uh, you know, the, the person who is healthy uh, will be like uh, maybe more positive than the person who is uh, sick uh, and so on. So uh, and so it will also affect the decision making as well. And uh, also belonging to a group and what uh, kind of uh, media we consume, what kind of literature we read, uh, uh, what kind of uh, maybe channels we uh, we watch on, on YouTube or we follow on Facebook and Instagram. So all of this, uh, uh, all of that affect uh, the worldview. And what I want to uh, propose and, uh, you know, uh, the uh, institute like ours, and I think many other institutes, uh, uh, Islamic uh, based uh, institutes, what we propose and uh, invite people is to uh, be affected by the revelation more. I mean, read the revelation, and study it, and uh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, shape our worldview uh, through the uh, through the revelation, and uh, also relationships. So why it is important here that uh, shapes the worldview? Uh, just one simple example here for uh, uh, maybe uh, not uh, uh, maybe a limited example, but then maybe some of you have read uh, books by. And the author that I wanted to uh, uh, bring an example of is that as a historian, he wrote a lot about uh, the Muslim civilization, uh, Islamic civilization. And, uh, and his, uh, uh, for, throughout 60s and 70s and 80s, I think his works were uh, very good and very positive of, of Muslims. But then something happened and, uh, you know, in his relationship uh, and then uh, and this is uh, known among among some of the uh, uh, scholars in, in history uh, that something happened uh, to him, and then uh, his wife left him, and so he started uh, he started writing uh, be, be, to be very negative of uh, of Muslims and Islam in general. Is uh, it Bernie Lewis? Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Oh. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, one of the things that uh, really affects. I mean, it's uh, uh, many things, many things do affect. And so we have to recognize uh, that these things do affect, all right? And uh, 
and also I mentioned something about the software or the uh, the the view, the worldview or the perception. And there is an axiom in uh, in Islamic jurisprudence that uh, that uh, reads like al hukmu ala shay and an tasawwuri. So uh, judgment of a thing is a function of its perception. So perception here uh, actually means uh, complete understanding, or uh, you know, uh, as much uh, uh, you know as much understanding of, as you can develop uh, as a wide understanding of uh, of something of a uh, of a uh, of an issue or challenge or problem. So uh, and only upon uh, this complete um, uh, complete understanding of this the uh, or the, uh, the the view conceptual uh, conceptual understanding, then you can uh, develop a hokum on uh, about it. Uh, but but it's a it's a result of uh, of an inductive reasoning on the part of scholars. It's not. Uh, uh, it's not in the Quran, uh, you know, but it is a kind of inductive reasoning uh, by the uh, by the scholars that they came up with this uh, kind of rule. It's uh, so. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, critically assess fundamental knowledge, sources, and assumptions. What makes? Uh, what are the fundamental things that we <clears throat> that we know in economics? What are the assumptions uh, that we uh, that we believe? And what are the sources of those assumptions? And, uh, and uh, we need to look at them critically. Uh, so one of the things we need to look at uh, critically, and of course many many scholars have, have done it, uh, is the idea of uh, of, of like uh, uh, the perfect information, for example, or the uh, uh, you know the the assumption of equilibrium, uh, complete equ equilibrium. You know that uh, you need to. Uh, it, it is uh, the economy is able to achieve its equilibrium uh, if it is a free market, uh, like a complete uh, free market economy. Uh, you know, and people and the human beings are completely rational. So there are many assumptions that have been uh, that have been questions, but also uh, we need to, uh, from the Islamic uh, from the Islamic perspective, we also need to critically assess uh, our. Uh, our beliefs uh, as to what is the what is the fundamental knowledge what that I am carrying right now uh, where the, where is it born is it uh, in uh, is it in the Quran is it in the in the words of a of a scholar uh, that, that I uh, rely more on you know or is it is it a correct understanding uh, you know and, and many of this so it's a critical assessment of uh, our fundamental knowledge. And then uh, also to decide what constitutes the primary source and study, uh, you know, primary source for studies and for research. And so uh, if uh, we accept the uh, Al-Quran Al-Karim as the primary source, that we need to base all our uh, understanding on this, you know, everything uh, that we need to be, uh, uh, whatever follows after that, it needs to follow, uh, you know, be, be based uh, on that uh, on the book of Allah. And uh, to quote one uh, one scholar here in in Turkey, uh, Prof. Mehmet Okuyan, he always tells us uh, says about uh, the uh, kind of three uh, three levels of uh, Muslims that one uh, or three groups or three levels of Muslims that uh, one uh, one group or one level is that they talk about the Quran without without knowledge about it. The other one is, uh, and their thinking is uh, not from the Quran, but uh, it's from completely different paradigm, but they, they may say uh, something that the uh, Quran says so and so. Uh, it is kind of, it's kind of uh, a jahili kind of view. And I have seen many, many people like that also in uh, back in back in Russia. Who out of uh, nowhere, out of blue, will say uh, the Quran says this, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, it doesn't, and the Quran doesn't have anything uh, to do with that kind of statement, for example. Uh, another level is uh, the people who uh, read the Quran constantly, and uh, uh, and uh, whatever they see, whatever they encounter in their life, uh, they uh, they analyze and they state uh, some of their views based on their understanding of the Quran. And the third level is the highest level is those who uh, talk uh, on behalf of the Quran, or those who are mufassirun, uh, those who are interpreters, interpreters of the uh, of the Quran. 
And of course, these are these are the people that we uh, need to uh, contact. We need to uh, listen to and uh, you know study uh, study with them and uh, see what they have to do, their methodologies, uh, and so on. And all this, based on that, uh, we need to construct a personal and also societal commun uh, communal uh, worldview based on that primary uh, primary source. And also critically assess our own paradigm and the methodology and adopt the methodology that closely follows the primary source. And for that, we need to understand the uh, the methodology of uh, Al Quran and Karim and the uh, you know and I guess we can uh, we will also talk about it uh, in a minute and uh, inshallah I hope uh, Dr Zaid will also uh, uh, add to it in, uh, uh, in in just a few moments inshallah so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the thing that we need to talk here is uh, the what what is actually the uh, the objectives based methodology that we at Makassit Institute that we talk about, that we propose and we uh, that we promote. And uh, it starts uh, it starts with the purpose. And uh, all of us, I think those who studied uh, Islam, Islamic, uh, you know, Islamic studies, uh, we would often hear this uh, <clears throat> you know, this hadith uh, about the uh, you know in the the hadith from a famous hadith from Umar ibn al-Khattab. Uh, that uh, says that uh, the uh, the deeds are according to the uh, to the purpose or to the intentions, and so we start with the purpose, and the purpose needs to be uh, in accordance with uh, uh, with the uh, with the book of Allah. So, uh, like uh, uh, like the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, "Inna salati wa nusika wa mahiya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alamin, la sharika la." Uh, so whatever we do, whatever uh, we try to do, you know, we need to also question our purposes. Is it for Allah? Is it for the sake of Allah? Or is it for the sake of, uh, you know, academic advancement? Is it for the sake of uh, just to you know, publish a paper and get, uh, uh, you know, and get some promotion and so on? So it's very important also to question the purpose. And uh, the next uh, next one is to, uh, whenever we have the uh, the problem, and the purpose that is outlined, then we need to also start doing the uh, cycles of reflection. We need to uh, read the uh, the Quran and Sunnah, uh, as uh, you know, it's a uh, repeated reading. So, you know, why do we need to do that? Is uh, just to uh, form the Quranic worldview, so that uh, we, whenever we analyze the things, whenever we see something in the world around us, uh, we analyze them we look at them not only from the uh, from the worldview uh, of our disciplines that we studied uh, let's say we studied economics or finance or uh, psychology and we tend to look at things uh, based on our luggage or our baggage uh, but then we need to develop uh, this worldview the Quranic worldview by uh, reading reading the uh, reading the book of Allah often and also, of course, uh, it needs to be paired with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this uh, this is done with the uh, with the purpose of, uh, uh, as I said, the, uh, building our own worldview. And also, we need to uh, build a, some sort of a conceptual framework. So we look at uh, we look at the concepts that are related uh, to uh, whatever we read or whatever we want to study. We look at the objectives of those ideas that are related uh, to it and how they are related to, let's say, for if it is from one ayah, how is it related to another ayah and also how this uh, issue is uh, has been uh, covered by uh, by the uh, all of the Quran and the Sun. Uh, of course, it is a very uh, deep and, uh, you know, difficult, uh, difficult methodology, but then uh, this uh, just is there something to, for us to uh, think about and to practice. You know, the uh, uh, if we practice it more and more, inshallah, it will come as a second uh, second nature. And uh, then, of course, we would need to also be uh, very well uh, grounded and uh, at least know and understand uh, the uh, what are the literature uh, the to know the literature in. Um, uh, whatever the discipline that we are, it's uh, economics or uh, anything, social sciences, natural sciences, we need to see, we need to know what is, uh, what are the, 
the main theories, the authors, what they talk about, and so on, and also critically uh, assess them and uh, try to assess them critically. And then once we do that, uh, once we have our own conceptual framework based on the Quran, we look at the uh, this, uh, issues and problems, how they are, uh, how they are given in the uh, in in other literature, then we can also already start analyzing and uh, you know offering our own uh, explanations or theories. You know, or, uh, you know, we can form our own explanation uh, on that. And uh, so it can be uh, applied in research and can be applied in education and uh, and action. And so uh, also uh, we propose another uh, view of, uh, of the scholarship, uh, the classification of scholarship. And uh, we want to uh, like divide them into truly anything that is related to uh, the uh, study of the Quran and Sunnah and all related to it, like uh, Surah Tafsir, Surah Al-Fiqa, uh, and Hadith, uh, and Al-Kalam, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this kind of uh, you know, uh, fundamental studies. Uh, that are related specifically to the Quran stream. Then uh, there are disciplinary studies today that we have. I mean, these are all you know, social sciences, human sciences, natural sciences, uh, and applied sciences. Uh, and we want to also uh, invite and uh, you know uh, more scholars into phenomena studies, uh, so that we understand uh, phenomena from the uh, transdiscipline or kind of interdisciplinary perspective as they happen in the world today. And uh, another another area that we can look at is the strategic uh, strategic studies it is uh, something that we develop strategies for our families, our communities, for the uh, for the ummah, based on the uh, Quran and Sunnah, uh, so that we also need to be able to uh, you know, like strategize or develop uh, public policies, develop the uh, public uh, policies for uh, for you know, like economic policies and and, uh, and other types of policies in. Uh, in different jurisdictions. Uh, so again, based on uh, based on the uh, Quran and the Sunni. And lastly, in my presentation, I just want to very quickly show you just a few of my uh, understanding here on uh, how uh, you know we can look at uh, some of the uh, how we can develop some map of the economic concepts, uh, for example, in the in the Quran. And it's just a very, uh, very basic, I would say, and it can be uh, it can be developed further. But it just gives uh, kind of uh, an overview how you can look at uh, the uh, how economic concepts Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives them, how they how He covers them uh, in Al Quran Al Karim, and uh, I. Uh, this is again. This is just something. Uh, it's a work in progress, and uh, you know there are many things that can be added and uh, that can enhance our our framework, our understanding. And so we can we can look at many concepts. Uh, and if you look at the uh, Quran, uh, there are many many ayats that are talk of, uh, that talk about rizq and in fact. And uh, actually, I would like to thank uh, from here. Uh, Dr. Basma, uh, Dr. Basma Bilhafar, who uh, joined one of our classes at uh, Reimagining Economics, and uh, she also, uh, you know, stated that uh, uh, we may start with uh, with the concept of risk. And so I also looked at it, and uh, you know, that we uh, we can look at the concept of uh, infarct and ilmal and sadaq and zakah and others. So there are many concepts that we can look and also related objectives. So. Uh, what are the uh, objectives that are related to it is uh, like uh, taqwa, for example, and the shukr, and ibadah, and uh, iman, and falah, uh, and also um, uh, we can uh, include here uh, uh, hayat al-tayyibah, for example, and also ta'awun, and imarat al-art is another uh, objective. Uh, and mizan and tazkiyah, and dhikr. Many of these concepts can also be uh, objectives as well. And the uh, the values that uh, we can look at it is that uh, uh, you know uh, risk uh, is has been a portion for all creatures, so it's given for uh, for everyone. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one that uh, portions uh, the risk, and uh, and also uh, some will get more risk uh, than others. <clears throat> and uh, iman and taqwa can actually may result in uh, in uh, in blessings from. Uh, from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, from the heaven and from the earth, 
and uh, servants of Allah uh, that walk on earth uh, lightly. So Ibad uh, al-Rahman, Ibad al-Rahman, Yamshun ala ardi hawna. So these are uh, kind of values uh, that you can look at. And there are many commands uh, that you can see, uh, like uh, travel through the land and see and seek his rizq and spend. And uh, actually on spending and charity, there are, I think the majority of the uh, ayahs that are related to infaq are, uh, or related to economic concepts are, uh, that deal with, uh, with infaq or spending. Uh, <clears throat> spending. Uh, like do not kill children out of fear of poverty uh, because Allah has provided for them and for you. Uh, eat what is pure and wholesome. Uh, do not eat or consume what is forbidden. Ta'awun uh, or cooperate in righteousness. So these are these are commands. Uh, these are given in the imperative. So if you read it in the Arabic, uh, you will see that these are given in as a command, as an sphere uh, al uh, also, write down uh, debt-based uh, agreements, and then uh, do not make wealth circulate only among the wealthy among you. Uh, do not give gifts to persons in authority as, as a bride. Uh, do not destroy the balance uh, or cut ties of kinship. Uh, and uh, also from the hadith, you can see uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 so these are the, just some of the commands, you know, that, that are related uh, to the economic uh, concepts. And some of the universal uh, laws that I have enumerated are here, uh, like Allah is the one who provides from the heaven and the earth. So rizq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a universal uh, law. It doesn't uh, affect only Muslims, uh, it's it, it is for everyone. Allah does not Allah does not charge a soul except uh, what He has given it, what He has given it. Many creatures do not carry their provision, but Allah provides them and for you, uh, for humans. And no bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another, and each person will have what they strive for. And everything in nature is created with balance, and riba does not increase in the sight of Allah. And there are many uh, groups of people that are uh, that we can see that are mentioned in the Quran. And if we look, uh, let's say specifically at uh, rizq, we can see that uh, uh, other related concepts throughout the Quran, like kalmal and sadaqah and zakah and hasan and, and afu and uh, riya and qayyibat and tarb fil ard. Uh, and also albir, uh, also puwa in ribat al khayl, you know, something that is related to the military power, and then you need to uh, be prepared as well. Uh, and also akl al mal, ribat al, and actually, this uh, uh, I, um, if not equate, but I look at uh, uh, riba as uh, also related to akl al mal, ribat al, this is like uh, these are equated for. Uh, you know, I look them uh, as uh, related uh, concepts and terms. Uh, also related with uh, the uh, Adal and Zulm and Rahma and many others. And again, among objectives, we see uh, Taqwa and Imarat al-Art and Midan, uh, Mizan and Ibad and so on. And the values, again, risk is a portion for all creatures. And, uh, you know, if we, if you do, uh, uh, if you obey Allah, you know, if you are a believer and if you do good, uh, you will have no fear and uh, you will not grieve. Uh, and so, uh, and also you will never again attain righteousness unless you spend from what you love. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, one of the most powerful ayats uh, yeah, about uh, albir and also albir is uh, is defined as a uh, 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 defined in Surah Al Baqarah, I think, 177. Uh, albir is uh, you can uh, define it as taqwa, and also with the iman and uh, you, you know uh, paying zakat uh, and and every, uh, everything else that is in, in that uh, ayah 177 of Al Baqarah. Uh, and uh, among the commands uh, again uh, spending. Uh, and so on. You can you can read it here. Uh, spending from the good things of Taibat. So do not give what you yourself will not accept. This is important here. Uh, also, you'll see it in, in Surah Al-Baqarah. 
And actually, if you read in Surah Al-Baqarah, just before, uh, just before the ayat from al riba you will see, uh, I think, more than 10, uh, about 10, 15 ayats that are specifically related to, uh, to uh, in fact, in sadaqah. You know, it's a moral uh, kind of ethical view of uh, sadaqah and, in fact, how we are supposed or not supposed to uh, uh, supposed to spend and not supposed to spend. And one of the things that you uh, must never do, uh, you know, is uh, uh, give a sadaqah for something, something that you will yourself will not accept. Uh, you know, so you need to be giving something out of what you love. And uh, we have the uh, the examples from the Sahaba where uh, they really, uh, you know, subhanAllah, they uh, uh, really gave out of what they love. And, uh, you know, they, they like, uh, nobody surpassed Abu Bakr in, uh, in how he, uh, how we spend, uh, you know, subhanAllah. I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, things that we can learn uh, from that. And uh, also universal laws, uh, you know, uh, you cannot achieve righteousness unless you spend what, uh, what you love. And lastly, here about, uh, uh, about riba, again, there are uh, concepts related to it as uh, al-mal and sadaqah, akl al-mal bil-batil, and it is uh, vun, uh, and so on. And there are many objectives. Uh, so that uh, you want to condemn riba, and then uh, uh, you, you know also to put on notice that if you continue uh, that practice, then uh, expect a war from Allah and His Messenger, and then also that Allah will like remove, or will uh, just yamhap Allah riba, uh, and so on. And uh, so this is uh, in the, uh, this is how I look at it, and we we can develop them further. And so, uh, the lastly, the message, uh, the message here. What I would like to uh, say here is that um, we can uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, send this uh, book as a complete book, as a, uh, something that uh, we need to learn from, and that He did not. Uh, and He says that one of rotna fil kitab min shay, and there is uh, a lot that we need to learn from it, and. Uh, you know, subhanAllah, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a work in progress. And I just wanted to share this with you that uh, maybe you can uh, join in, uh, you know, looking at this, uh, uh, at this law seriously and uh, try to uh, use this methodology as we explain, or maybe you yourself, you, how you can understand this, uh, this methodology and you develop it further. With us or with your your uh, uh, with your colleagues at uh, your universities at your institutions uh, and so on, or you can take it up as a, as one of as a methodology in, in your PhD and so on. So with this, I thank you very much. I think I'm just I uh, took too much too much of the time, and I hope it was beneficial for all of you and for myself. Uh, thank you very much. Zakallah uh, khair, Dr. Ildus. And in a few uh, minutes, we will open, uh, inshallah, the floor for your questions and discussions. Uh, you are very much welcome to do all of that. Uh, it's my a few comments. Uh, it, this is uh, an intensive process. Uh, we are trying to reimagine the world uh, according to the revelation, uh, Al-Quran, Karim, and Sunnah. And this is... Uh, an incredibly hard process because uh, not just that the world that we live in uh, is overwhelm overwhelmingly uh, controlled by a secular uh, view or some religious fanatic views. Um, I mean, sometimes we don't understand how incredibly uh, strong the influence of uh, some religious views, for example, on the U.S. policy. Uh, so the so-called um, Christian Zionists uh, who are stronger in support of uh, the Israeli uh, and just uh, and criminal project than even um, the many of the Jews who are in America. So there are all of these views uh, and we see that there are you know strong support for them and this is and they paint a worldview all around us and this worldview not only just um, that we don't just only just live in this worldview, uh, but we are indoctrinated 
in this worldview, and that is any field of knowledge uh, that experiences intensive indoctrination, it would be economics. Uh, in economics, we typically, in any mainstream uh, field of study, uh, we study um, either economics based on uh, neoclassical and neoclassical theory, and when we try to be a bit more fancy, we introduce uh, Keynesian economics. Uh, all other orthodox views uh, or a heterodox view or so-called heterodox views are usually not uh, introduced. Uh, this is very unique situation in economics. It's really brainwashing uh, because almost in every any other social science field, uh, you do not just study one or two uh, theories. Usually there's a lot of theories, a lot of approaches uh, to dealing with uh, any issue. So it is incredibly hard. Yes, it is incredibly uh, hard uh, to uh, to to start to reimagine uh, this world. Uh, nevertheless, there have been uh, lots of efforts in this field, uh, and we do not claim that we are reinventing uh, the wheel. We just want to uh, build on what we've learned and try to push this conversation and discussion uh, forward. Uh, the fundamental thing that is what we propose at the Maqasid Institute that this reimagination process has to start with reflecting on the Quran Karim, and the first step is tadabbur, and that uh, and this term of tadabbur it means just simply following the ayat, uh, and don't be selective in the following the ayat. Follow the ayat from Surah Al Fatiha all the way to uh, Al Ikhlas and uh, and Nas. Uh, follow one by one. So this is the number. Just follow the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you contemplate one issue or one question or one objective. And this is not something uh, even new. This is not something that the Maqasid Institute came up with uh, or Sheikh Jasser Oda came up with. This is something that uh, in Imam Shafi'i is famous to, uh, to, be, to have practiced uh, that when he was asked a question, he would sometimes uh, fully read the Quran Karim once or twice or three times before answering that question, and I believe that was actually also the practice of many other uh, of our major scholars. Uh, and then, if anybody knows anything about Imam Shafi'i, he had like almost photographic memory. Uh, yet he would uh, go and involve himself in that process of tadabbur, and after the tadabbur comes this process of, for example, uh, if you want to term it tafakkur like you reflect on what you have uh, learned. And then everything that like was described in the methodology, the seven elements, um, uh, it's all to help us organize our tafakkur. After you have contemplated uh, what you've read in the Quran, Karim, how would you put that uh, together uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in an organized fashion? And this is an intensive thinking process. You can carry it alone or you can carry it uh, in a group uh, it depends on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you or what tendencies uh, you are uh, uh, been gifted with some people cannot work in a group some people love to work in a group uh, but the idea is that we have to be involved in this kind of a process and when you have developed ideas you bring it to the forum here to the research forum and we can present it so in this regard, with our effort, and uh, uh, we have a special dedicated group uh, discussing uh, the imagining economic and finance. Um, and in that group, there are many voices and people who come with uh, sometimes uh, deep experiences uh, with Islamic finance, Islamic economics, people who spend their lifetime. And in this regard, inshallah, the idea is that we want to create a multi-track uh, presentation. Uh, some of them will bring these experts uh, and they present their own view, uh, not necessarily from a maqasid methodology uh, perspective, uh, but they can simply present it and we can discuss it and we uh, benefit from it. And then we can also have a dedicated uh, forum where we try to actually take one issue and we dive deeply into it from a maqasid methodology uh, perspective. And we can also discuss and, and debate uh, the, the, the process but everything else discussed here is that uh, besides contemplating the Quran Karim and relating the Sunnah of the Prophet to the Quran Karim 
I want to really make sure that you all understand this is a human ishtihad, human effort and ishtihad. Uh, it can be critiqued, can be added to, can be taken out. We simply uh, try to be among those uh, that those among those who uh, hear and uh, follow the best of whatever they hear uh, and, and incorporate that. But there's no avoidance of the putting down the hard work of, of thinking and contemplating and one of the steps and the methodology is this, that what we try to, to do is that trust in Allah's word when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us all that iqra, read, read for yourself. Uh, and it's not just simply sounding the words, but actually to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, trying to communicate to us. Second, to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and tells us that I have made this Quran easy for contemplation and understanding. So where are those who are, you know, uh, ready to understand and contemplate? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, uh, I believe I would not, I would believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of those who tell me that I am not adequate enough to understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or to contemplate the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is Allah's promise versus uh, some other people's. Now, it is very important in this process that, again, there is a very uh, the role of the group or jama'a to correct each other's understanding of the Quran Kareem or to enhance each other's understanding of the Quran Kareem. So, as like Dr. Ildus mentioned, we do not have uh, an uh, interpretations of the Quran Kareem that are wild, that are beyond the, the bound, that has no relationship uh, to the text. Uh, itself to the Quran Karim, to the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has no relationship to a holistic understanding of Al-Quran Karim. Uh, that is also incredibly uh, important and that comes from the, like I said, two, two uh, factors. One is that the group of uh, of knowledgeable and uh, you know, expert and concerned Muslims who are formed these groups uh, and then, uh, for example, the fuqaha of iqtisad and fuqaha of, you know, it can be social sciences and psychology, so on and so forth. And, and the group kind of complement and correct each other. And if we have further differences on some interpretation, then we always have what we call the usuli scholars uh, who have deep knowledge of the Quran, Karim, the Arabic language and the Sunnah. Uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam and then they can be uh, referenced. Uh, and Alhamdulillah Maqasid Institute uh, have uh, plenty of, mashallah, of these of such uh, scholars that we can uh, refer uh, to. So that, that is a very uh, important the other thing is what we call uh, one of the steps in the Maqasid methodology uh, uh, references uh, literature review. And in the literature review comes the point where you can, we can consult uh, or it is uh, important for us to consult uh, li the literature. And part of the literature is the tafsir uh, of the Quran. Can be part of the literature is the understanding of our uh, four uh, uh, scholars and, uh, and, and previous scholars uh, over, you know, uh, 1,400 years of uh, history of Islam. Uh, nobody can really progress Without, uh, without remembering their roots and uh, remembering the, this massive wealth of wisdom that was left uh, to us. Uh, so this is also important to correct uh, our understanding, but it is incredibly important to not allow initially uh, direct interaction with the Quran Kareem. That is the fundamental thing that the Maqasa methodology calls upon all of us to, to do, is that Allow the Quran Karim, allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak to you directly. Um, to you, with all of your experience and all of your life challenges, all the knowledge that Allah has given you. Because once you immediately refer to tafsir, then that is, even though it comes from a great scholar, uh, but that's still that, that this tafsir is the understanding of that specific scholar at specific period of time. Uh, of that verse, even that same scholar, if he would read the same ayah uh, after one year or two years or ten years or whatever, you know, he would have probably deeper understanding or different understanding of the same ayah. 
it just because this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and this is the miraculous nature of Al-Quran Kareem. So this is just really few comments I wanted to uh, share with you and uh, I'm very happy if you would like to um, uh, you know join uh, raise a question or um, uh, discuss a point uh, please either like uh, raise uh, your hand or you can uh, speak up if uh, I have one hand raised. Tafadal, Akhir. No. Oh, this is Sheikh Bashir. Tafadal, Dr. Bashir. All right. Assalamu alaikum, Alhamdulillah. And uh, okay. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dus, for that, uh, for me, very eye opening uh, presentation and uh, uh, insight into uh, this paradigm. Um, I have two questions, if you'll permit me. My first question uh, has to do with epistemology and teleology. Um, so, in my understanding, uh, in terms of the Islamic worldview and its expression, Islamic scholarship, uh, it seems that... Uh, Epistemology is everything, pretty much, because we you know we have to have that basis of knowledge and and our scripture, etc. Um, don't find your speaking language. Okay, so um, uh, and of course we have a variety of paradigms when it comes to what is accepted as epistemology. You know, between the different schools of thought, etc. It appears that the most the common denominator that apparently is universally accepted is the authority of the Quran and that of Mutawatir Hadith. And then after that, whether the hadith is Sahih or different grades, and of course that's also subject to who classifies, uh, it is all Dhanni. It's you know, so. If we were to, to, to envision a paradigm of epistemology where the Quran and Mutawatir Ahadith are the, is, is like the base, the core epistemology, and anything outside of that becomes acceptable or ignorable, uh, particularly or ignorable, particularly when it comes to nahi or prohibitions based on the view that the default state of things is ibaha, is permissibility. Um, now, if one were to adopt such a paradigm in terms of epistemology, will this be considered heretical? Will it be considered heretical and of rejecting, you know, a hadith, for example, when you have a, an attitude of, okay, if a hadith is not mutawatir, then uh, it is left to the scholar or the jurist to adopt or accept or to what extent they will uh, use that in forming, you know, a ruling or in understanding something. So which leaves a much a wider sort of uh, arena for, you know, interpreting and um, uh, navigating the, uh, you know, between the text and the reality. So I don't know if that question came out uh, clearly enough, but that I would like your thoughts on that. Um, and may I ask the second one, or do I wait for the answer to this first? Let's uh, uh, let's address the first one. Okay. Okay. In terms of uh, epistemology, uh, yeah, the uh, the sources of knowledge and uh, the nature of knowledge uh, in Islam, and again, uh, you know, here. Uh, I am just uh, expressing my own uh, my own view, and uh, uh, some um, uh, at the Makassar Institute, of course, will uh, uh, may uh, agree with it. So, uh, the uh, epistemologically, the source is Al Quran Al Karim, and when it comes to Hadith, uh, I personally uh, am very cautious uh, because I do not want to uh, say or express something. As, as if it has been said by, by the Prophet of Allah uh, without full knowledge. And I am not, uh, I'm not, I'm not an expert in 
in Hayif. Whereas the Quran is there, it is open, and as uh, Allah has uh, mentioned, you know, I mean, and if it is, uh, it's Mubin Mubayyan, uh, it is open for uh, for people for, to to understand uh, and to read. Uh, of course, the uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Hadith Mutawatir uh, uh, that we need to accept it. Is it at the same uh, the same level? Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I personally uh, place all the Hadith, all the Sunnah under the uh, under the Quran. So the Quran is at the uh, like it's uh, it's not the pinnacle. I mean, it's the the main. It's the primary source. I mean, it's the primary source. Everything else. I mean, all the hadith are the secondary source. Even though uh, there are uh, there are scholars who uh, who would uh, 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 who would uh, contradict that, who will debate that, and of course that they have their own uh, reasons for that. And uh, you know, even even to the extent they are saying that. Uh, the uh, Sunnah is uh, is the main uh, main explainer. So, uh, will it be heretical? Uh, well, if you read the Quran, I mean, the Quran speaks for itself, and if you accept the Quran, if you accept uh, the uh, also the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu I don't think it is heretical. But we, uh, I am personally very cautious about the Hadith. If I'm uh, if I don't see that it is uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, it's not only hadith, but it's not contradicting uh, the Quran, and if uh, also I would really uh, be very careful before mentioning it, if I'm not really sure that uh, you know it's uh, that it is safe, you know, it's safe to uh, quote the hadith, uh, so that I <clears throat> I know the uh, where it, uh, I know the riwaya, I know the. Uh, the way it comes and the, maybe the Senate and so on, uh, and its classification. Uh, so in terms of hadith, I would uh, really be, I mean, I'm personally very cautious. And uh, epistemologically, the Quran is the primary source. Uh, Sunnah is the secondary source and everything else uh, need to be also uh, like uh, be looked at, analyzed, uh, critically looked at, critically studied, critically based on this uh, primary and secondary sources that's that's my uh, view uh, and i hope it's uh, 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 clear and it is part of the uh, you know, hopefully it's part of the democracy thinking yeah. that's how i am yeah if, if i may add uh, just few commentary now so obviously this is uh, as uh, dr indus uh, mentioned uh, uh, interacting with the hadith uh, and the differences of opinions among scholars uh, from a long time until now. I remember one of the uh, early research uh, topics that I had uh, was Hujjiyat uh, al-Sunnah, which is the, the wider context uh, here is that um, what is the degree of, uh, uh, of depending on the Sunnah when it comes to uh, Sharia and Islam in general and Fiqh. And here we have Sometimes we talk about two different things because I, you know, if you come from a point of view, so you're talking, you start talking about epistemology, and then you quickly started talking about mubah wa man hi anhu and al haram and and then we can exclude, and this is all within the context and this is of of ahkam, which is really like this is the Sharia or this is the legal Islamic uh, system, from an epistemology. Uh, point of view, uh, the haram and mubah all is indication. Like, you know, why is this haram? So we have to understand the wisdom behind the tahrim as part of understanding the, the proof or the hujjah and um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in how Islamic uh, Islam reasoning and, and reaching uh, decision or reaching, even reaching tasawwur uh, uh, to develop ahkam uh, arrives at uh, uh, we arrive at that. So this is all uh, important, but you can see how the perspective in economics, we're going to try to see how does that translate into uh, productive economic systems versus unproductive or like uh, what are the ma'alat and not a ma'alat just simply and in, in, in ahkam uh, to just to reach haram and halal just to see that what is the best uh, situation for humanity. Going back to the 
to the issue of uh, a sunnah. Uh, now, so so one thing that is it, one of one of the biggest challenges when we started dealing with a sunnah. Now, well, obviously, I had a sunnah wal jamaa. Uh, I, I believe we are all here, uh, part of that group. Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, then we completely. Uh, realize that uh, it is one of the most precious things that we have in our life is to know uh, about the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam and to know every single detail about his his life uh, to uh, to follow his example in uh, and, and that just just is uh, out of our deep love for the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam so this is really ingrained this is indisputable uh, the challenge as we can see from the early on, from the Hanafi school of thought, uh, based on Ibn Mas'ud and, and other early uh, Sahaba, uh, Allah, we understand that number one, they do have uh, a big range of assessment of hadith strength. So when you mentioned uh, uh, Tawatur, uh, and some uh, recognized scholars consider that there is probably just one Mutawatur hadith which is من كذب قوله صلى الله تعالى صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم من كذب علي متعمدا فليتبوأ مقعده من النار. He who lie upon me uh, intentionally let him uh, uh, have his seat in hellfire. So then if you just go out and say like how many mutawatir hadith uh, exist? And a mutawatir hadith is very important because in matters of aqidah, we only accept mutawatir hadith. We do not accept uh, ahad. Now, even in, in ahkam, where we started having differences, but uh, again, most of the time, for to purely say halal and haram, uh, or especially haram, uh, we would like to have something that is mutawatir and sahih, which is very hard to find. So then we end up in that area where uh, this is uh, has a sahih sanad and so on and so forth, but uh, have, it can have different in interpretations. And one of the major issues about the interpretation of the hadith, even if it's a sahih sanad and it has uh, the chain is, is strong, is that uh, we always end up with what is the context and we end up with uh, what what is the fullest version of that hadith. So uh, an Imam al-Bukhari, uh, rahimahullah, he would mention the same hadith in different abwab uh, in his book. And the reason this is mentioned and is done that, is that uh, because he's trying to get one part of the hadith to address one issue. And the hadith that is being mentioned in the different abwab and different section uh, in the book uh, is not the same length. It's not the same a full context uh, uh, and the full text. So that I can find it one longer narration than another one. And the longer narration, usually, typically, the longer the narration of the hadith, it gives you a lot more insight into what is being said and what is being uh, discussed. Uh, there are why the Prophet ﷺ said this or that. Uh, that is, tends to be really a huge uh, challenge uh, uh, when dealing with uh, the hadith that we do not know the context uh, of the hadith fully. So that just opens the door for interpretation. So what we say uh, in the Maqasid uh, uh, methodology, and this is the suggestions of uh, Sheikh Jazir Oda, and we are following to a great extent uh, the approach of Sheikh Taha uh, Jabir al-Alwani, is that uh, the supremacy should always be to Al-Quran Kareem and to holistic understanding of Al-Quran Kareem, not to the op opinion of any major scholar. And uh, when it comes to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, that hadith needs to follow the uh, overall direction and uh, of the Qur'an Kareem. And there are, when we reach some very uh, difficult decisions, uh, if there's some specific hadith, then we have to really, uh, uh, then that's what becomes an area of, of, of deep scholarship. And uh, this is what I said, that this is raised to the level of uh, Usuli scholars to have that deeper conversation. But until we get there, until we get to that point, uh, let us first focus on contemplating Quran Karim and understanding the Sunnah. And that's why one of the things that we recommend when dealing with the Sunnah of the Prophet 
uh, is to use uh, the book Ma'ali Musunna the Sheikh Saleh Hashami. So what Sheikh Saleh Hashami did, who is by orientation, he is of the Salafi uh, uh, approach uh, or Ahl al-Athar. Uh, what he did is that he combined, he, he narrated the most accurate of hadiths uh, from nine books of, uh, actually more than nine books, but he put all the real narrations of one hadith all together so that you can see all the different ways the hadith was mentioned and was stated and all the different understanding. And here's the very important thing. And again, I don't want to, we have a, we have a, a full course that that is available on demand um, that deals with the uh, Maqasid approach to uh, the Sunnah uh, by Dr. Ammar al-Hariri. It is in Arabic as of now. We try to see if we can make it in English, but it is in Arabic uh, as of now. And that's a fun, fun, fundamental course that for anybody who wants to get into this um, uh, into this area and to learn more about this area. So just want to, to, just to, to uh, you know, uh, Pay, you know, help you pay attention to that. I can put a, a link to the course in Shaba in, in, the, in the chat group. So this is just a, a quick uh, uh, kind of over uh, of the challenge uh, of uh, working with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. It is really, it's a huge area of, of, uh, of debate. But within that, we want to have proper treatment uh, of the subject by, you know, not just simply allowing anybody to just reject the hadith. That's why, like, we go through circles. Let's discuss this in our specialized groups, and when we have differences, we can raise it up to the next level to also the scholars to help us um, reach a, a decision on it. Allah <laughs> Um So... My second question, uh, Dr. Ildus, you mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning of your presentation uh, that is, is Islamic economics, for example, uh, we find ambiguities and certain contradicting paradigms uh, in the Islamic economics discipline. Um, I'd like to get maybe a couple examples or so where we have these kinds of ambiguities, you know, in in in, in the practical economics uh, that makes uh, the the concept the con the, you know the, the the concept or conceptualization of economic Islamic economics you know uh, problematic in terms of how it addresses or deals with practical reality. If we can get a, a couple examples of these ambiguities or contradictions. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So first, uh, first of all, uh, one uh, one area uh, that we can look at as uh, uh, first is the philosophy. You know, with the part of uh, the uh, Islamic economics textbooks, uh, when they, uh, at the very beginning, I mean, usually in textbooks, uh, the very first chapters, uh, first two, three chapters, they would uh, look at uh, the uh, the philosophy, the methodology. Uh, so that part is uh, uh, is sometimes it contradicts the more applied uh, sections of uh, textbooks. All right. So for example, if you uh, look the uh, you, if you read the book that I uh, uh, that I mentioned, uh, this uh, uh, published by Isra in two thousand eighteen. And as I mentioned, it is one of the best uh, Islamic economics textbooks today. Uh, Islamic economics principles and analysis, yeah, published in 2018. Uh, so the first three chapters, if I'm not mistaken, they are really good and they uh, provide uh, first three or four chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they provide a very nice uh, outline of uh, all the philosophical discussion, methodological discussions. Uh, that exist in uh, in this uh, in this field, but then when it comes to um, uh, let's say when it comes to uh, microeconomics, and so they explicitly they just follow this uh, neoclassical way of dealing with economics as uh, micro and my micro and micro, and so when they deal explicitly with uh, with the issues of uh, supply and demand, for example, so they they look at they use uh, still the same. Uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, um, what is it? Neoclassical ways and, and tools, uh, and the ways that the uh, the analysis, uh, the analysis that is used in uh, in microeconomics. Uh, but of course, they uh, after that they also uh, state some of the uh, ideas from Makassar Sharia, for example. And uh, this is actually another area in, uh, in in Islamic economics, and especially finance and banking, uh, Islamic finance and banking, where uh, they use Maqasid al-Sharia uh, not specifically as a critique, uh, but as a justification uh, of uh, you know the existing uh, the existing practices. Uh, all right, the existing practices of the banking, uh, the bank, Islamic banking industry. So, and there are a lot of books, and uh, actually, one of the uh, one of the books I uh, uh, I critiqued in my uh, PhD thesis, and I was really scolded about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is uh, something that exists in the in the literature. So, these are just uh, two uh, two examples uh, and usage of the Makassar Makassar Sharia, and also uh, when it comes to the uh, issue of money, for example, uh, money and monetary policy. Uh, they still use uh, the uh, kind of conventional and mainstream view of the nature of money and uh, the uh, monetary policy, the instruments of monetary policy, even though, you know, when, uh, if in the conventional, uh, uh, in the conventional uh, mainstream economics, they look at uh, the, um, uh, you know, interest rates, uh, you know, interest rates as the main, the, the, the main tool. Uh, but from the Islamic, uh, they would just uh, look, we need to uh, uh, you know, devise uh, like financing rate, you know, or something like that. So still the paradigm is the same, but trying to use that paradigm and from that, within that uh, conventional paradigm, uh, trying to, uh, uh, you know, bring some solutions like Islamizing, you know, Islamizing those uh, solutions. Uh, I'm not saying these are wrong, uh, but it is just one of the ways to look at uh, and uh, to look at the issues and uh, try to find uh, find a solution. And uh, you know, they've been talking about this and uh, looking at these issues for the past 40 years, since uh, beginning of 1980s, actually. And uh, the debates are still going on as to uh, you know what is riba and how to. Uh, with the revised zombie interest, or you know, uh, you know, they always write about riba and the riba and father, uh, and so on. Uh, so it, uh, these are just a few things, and uh, of course there are many, uh, like Sukuk, for example. And uh, in in Sukuk area again, uh, you can you can use the uh, con uh, contract like the Ijara contract. Uh, but uh, the economic effect is is uh, is the same as uh, normal bond. Uh, so uh, these are just a few things, and uh, you know, it, uh, these are matters of a uh, lot of critique. And I think scholars have also critiqued uh, these uh, these tools and these approaches. And uh, it's a huge area, definitely, it's a huge area. Like an like an example of that, of course, we have the aqid of uh, Tawarro that we have a huge controversy around it. Uh, there is a challenge here that this is obviously going around and around trying to solve a problem, which is some people need uh, companies or individuals or uh, you know businesses require liquidity, uh, maybe short-term liquidity. Then instead of just simply uh, giving that liquidity upfront, then we are uh, we end up with uh, one transaction you end up structuring two three transactions to get to the same result uh from and this is the big challenge and i would really would like to have everybody understand this point very carefully the people who uh, made ibaha for this transaction there is nothing about their taqwa there is nothing about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. It has nothing to do with, with any of that. But there is part of the modern or contemporary or the training of fuqaha that they truly believe that if they can meet the letter 
of uh, the fiqh or they meet the strict criteria uh, of interpretation, then they are okay. They are okay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are doing their, their job. Uh, and then even though that they are at some level violating the maqasid of Islam, the overall intent of the, the Sharia. And this is why the whole thing, why the Shatabi came up with this, because he is horrified by people, by fuqaha, uh, dealing with the text very, very carefully to try to justify certain uh, outcomes. Uh, and then that's why he like imposed the maqasid of the Sharia to avoid and try to close this door we call al hiyal al-Shari'iyya. Uh, one other example of this hiyal al-Shari'iyya uh, is that and this is, was uh, uh, mentioned to me by uh, doc, uh, Sheikh Dr. Uh, Ghazi Subhani, uh, who worked with, uh, you know, at several Islam, major Islamic banks uh, in the United Emirates. Uh, so the example was that uh, so you have all this wadi'a and you have all this uh, money deposited and so on and so forth and there is zakat accumulated on it and sometimes people give the bank the right uh, the Islamic bank the right to you know to to, uh, to manage the zakat uh, so the simple question well if we have people defaulting on loans can I just use the zakat to cover my uh, loan losses or uh, even uh, or uh, halal mortgage uh, losses. Uh, so the some the the, the fatwa uh, committee uh, that they consulted with, they said, no, this is just benefiting yourself, uh, and you cannot just benefit yourself this way. So, okay, so it cannot be ourself. Can it be another uh, halal bank institution? They said, yes, uh, literally, if you go uh, by the letter of the fiqh, yes, that is not you, so that's somebody else, so let's just, you can you can go ahead and do that. So what happened is that Halal Bank 1 uh, with Halal Bank 2, they made an agreement that I'm going to cover your uh, mortgage losses and defaults or late payment, and you're going to cover mine using our mutual zakat funds. So oh, I use wow. my zakat to help you out Use your zakat to help me out. Technically, this is from a strict fiqh point of view, this is okay. This is acceptable because there's two different parties. And then maybe even the rista'an, ala al taqwa. So that it can, that's, that's the challenge. Now, any layman Muslim look at this and say, well, there is something fishy here. There's just something that's not right. And again, to, to this. Uh, uh, Dr. Sheikh uh, uh, Razi Subhani, uh, the way he put it, like I was supporter of uh, halal banking. I, I sometimes try to use the word halal banking or Sharia complying uh, or fiqh complying uh, banking rather than Islamic banking. Because Islamic banking means that, or anything you put Islamic, that it is really for higher purpose, not for just profit making purpose. And these are businesses. Um, just like I don't call halal meat uh, Islamic meat. It is halal meat. It is, you know, uh, somebody who's trying to do, uh, to sell. Uh, I only want for him to sell me good, healthy halal meat and not give me charity or any, any form of, uh, of that sort. So uh, he get to the this point, which is something I share with him as well, is that sometimes it is worse to call something, uh, this is Islamic mortgage, um, when a layman Muslim looks at it and say, well, you just replace the word uh, interest rate with the word murabaha. And that's all you have done. Um, and no matter, of course, that we go into the details, no, this contract is structured this way, this contract is structured that way. But at the end of the day, no, it is. it, it does the same thing. So here we said, like, uh, sometimes it's better to say that and like from his perspective and my perspective as well, I, I carry that point of view, is that to say that, Look, this is a necessity um, that our community need to have homes. And right now, uh, we need to work hard to provide a truly Islamic approach to, uh, to provide. Until then, this is the least, uh, well, like this is a necessity to, to deal with this uh, Riva institution to allow people to, um, 
to pro provide housing for themselves rather than relabel the contract um, as a murabaha contract or something like that. This is, again, at the end of the day, I, I realized that, uh, uh, and uh, Sheikh uh, Ghazi and others uh, realized that many people uh, find comfort in calling this Islamic bank and calling this Islamic contract, and alhamdulillah, they're going ahead and, and getting their homes. And that is fine. But I would love for another class or group of, of concerned Muslims to find real solutions. And I think one of the challenges that we're having, whether it is in the West and sometimes elsewhere, uh, is that the young Muslims in America or UK or Europe, they don't accept these contradictions. When they see this, uh, when they see these, uh, this way of presenting Islam, so like, so really, what is Islam? It's just like labeling and wording. Uh, you told me that Islam is a much deeper and profound, uh, profoundly different than the capitalist society, but I only see you, uh, you know, making gimmicks and uh, and just changing uh, words around. Uh, and and there, when they pay attention to that, they may, they feel like they are, you know, betrayed. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this difference that we are raising is is trivial. So that's just in a, in a nutshell, like why we really need to uh, reimagine uh, economics and finance to find. Out from the root, a way to to resolve this um, superficial treatment of uh, of applying Islamic fiqh to uh, transaction matters or to Islam or to economic matters. Uh, can I? Yeah, can I quickly address this uh, 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 question here by Muhammad Sami uh in the in the chat? So is the normative things which are the human uh, becomes human need? Uh, do these also need approval from the Quran and Sunnah? Uh, for example, medicine available in prophetic times are different. Uh, does it mean that other late advancements are not acceptable? Uh, so I'm asking because uh, why there is a need of labor in Haram and Haram uh, to normative things? Uh, well, just. Uh, if I understood it, uh, uh, if I understood the question correctly, uh, what I'm stressing and what we stress at, uh, here at Makassat is that we need to develop the type of type of thinking. It's not uh, denying uh, anything, denying the uh, 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 you know the developments. Otherwise, we would uh, not use this uh, Zoom here today. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, we cannot say it uh, you know, because of uh, uh, some. Uh, maybe very uh, like um, uh, so some uh, what is that uh, if uh, some people use I mean some uh, uh, you know um, very deviant people like use the zoom uh, we cannot we cannot use uh, zoom because they do it uh, no of course not, of course not we just don't want to uh, uh, help or uh, you know realize the worldview that that's the that's the main thing and whatever is in the common sense i mean it, it is common sense if something is working let's say in the uh, uh in the medical industry like uh, uh the um, uh, some medicines which uh, which are modern and are helpful but then again even even the big pharma you have to be really critical uh, today and uh, you need to be also looking at their uh, the purposes of uh, those companies and uh, their uh, pricing policy and and so on their uh, the intellectual properties that uh, that they pursue and uh, there are many things uh, but uh, in terms of uh, like common sense things uh, you know we don't deny the novelties innovations. Uh, this kind of things in 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 technologies in industries, but then it uh, it needs to be like filtered. You know, we we have the worldview, uh, the Quranic worldview that can uh, serve as a filter. Yeah. Can I, I would like to address uh, uh, Sister Muna Saleh's uh, question mm -hmm. uh, that deals with um, the work of uh, Omar Badillo and uh, the end of economics. And the gold dinar. Uh, so uh, I came aware of, of about uh, this work, and I, I can't say I have read the book carefully, but I kind of skimmed through it. 
uh, because this is kind of part of my training. I'm a monetary economist, and I've uh, uh, you know I know these issues uh, around gold dinar. Uh, I am skeptic about the returning purely to the gold dinar. Now, uh, this can be part of the overall structure. Now, going to the gold dinar under what structure? Under the modern capitalist economic systems, uh, then no, it, it will be disastrous to go back to the gold, uh, a gold standard. Uh, it just does not fit with uh, our modern uh, economies. And one main major reason is that uh, one reason you're trying to say let's go let's use a gold uh let's use let's use a gold monetary system is that you we are assuming that supply of gold is constant and we're trying to assume that the relationship between the value of gold and uh, demand for gold relative to other uh, uh, products and services is uh, constant and these are just simply not true if you look at the value of gold now of course this is a problem sometimes like you don't say well, how are you determining that gold has a stable value or not because sometimes we're using uh, uh currency we're using fiat currency to determine that uh, but even if you use that as to translate and uh, like this is what the value of gold in terms of dollars and the, in terms of dollars this is what the dollars can can buy uh, and they also use the inflation in the indices um to determine, to translate this, and then we take the dollar out and see what is the purchasing power of gold. We see that gold purchasing power fluctuates uh, wildly, and that fluctuation uh, hurts uh, people uh, and hurts uh, economies, it hurts, and it depends on who is in control of vast supplies of gold. Uh, Venezuela suddenly needed uh, to get some more uh, liquidity, so they are dumping gold into uh, the market. Uh, other countries suddenly decided to switch to uh, have more gold in their reserves, like China and several other countries, and not hold as much dollar. Suddenly, there is a scarcity uh, uh, of gold in, in the market. Uh, so that is all of that creates a huge disruption when it comes to pricing things in, uh, in gold. And so, and then again, like in part of the economic phenomena study that we're trying to, to do is that to say, we need to, uh, to study each one of these factors at different levels. That is the, just the simple transaction level that like me, I'm gonna decide to save my money in gold. I can go ahead and put my money in gold um, and, and, be, and be, you know, maybe feel safe uh, that way. Alhamdulillah, that's good. But there is a macro level. Like, how do you run an economy? What does, uh, do we need monetary policy to get over um, uh, recession or depression? Uh, like, to relax monetary policy. So that is a bigger, very critical question that we need to address. And that, and that is then we call the social just lived reality of people and how they uh, need to deal. Uh, how, what, gold, what does gold play? Uh, in, in, in people's uh, social life and social con construct there, you know, our appreciation, our attraction to gold and, uh, and how that can change even by itself. Uh, so so there's, we need to understand all of these levels to come up with a full answer to gold, but just simply saying that gold can be uh, a, a fundamental solution for our problems today, uh, for our economic system, that we live in today, or is it is it a good starting point? Uh, I need to see a more convincing argument because the argument I see, it's more like micro level. So for example, one way that gold can help, uh, and I can agree with this, is that we have a big, we have a major challenge in fiqh, uh, in, in the denomination of uh, contract, of loan contract. So if I uh, am to borrow from one of you um, in uh, Lebanese lira or even Turkish uh, lira, uh, if, if I just say this is 100,000 Turkish lira and we know that I'm having close to 100% or 50% inflation rate, then um, I'm going to lose half of the value of the money I'm loaning out 
in one year. Uh, how is that uh, fair? Uh, so one solution uh, to this is to denominate this loan in gold value. Uh, to say, well, you know, this is 100,000 lira equal this much gold today. So I'm going to uh, denominate the loan in, uh, in gold. Um, and that is one way to preserve at least uh, the purchase value uh, of the money that I am loaning out. Now, even this form of contract has some uh, objections from some fuqaha just to put it out there, but I don't want to go deeper. But this is one way you can use um, uh, gold. In this case, we call it from a monetary point of view, we call it unit of account. So you use it as a unit account to denominate contracts and to denominate uh, loans uh, in general. So that is one way that we can, you can go ahead, people can go ahead and use. But, but if you use, for example, that form of contract, that is a big challenge because at the end of the year when I'm trying to pay back my loan in gold and I find that it's a 50% increase uh, because the rest of my transactions are all in Turkish lira and I'm not making suddenly 50% more profit uh, to be able to pay the, the gold uh, uh, loan. Uh, it, it creates a, a challenge uh, for people who are borrowing to pay back that uh, loan. Uh, so just that that is... This is what I mean by we are making a suggestion to try to reform a system, but when the whole system works against this proposal, this cannot be uh, this cannot be a, a, a true solution. Not under the current conditions, maybe a gold system can work, but under a, a different the, uh, uh, an economy that is imagined uh, differently. I want to add one more thing here to, to this, because it's a related point, which is fractional reserve system. And we have a lot of debate about the fractional reserve system. I personally do not see where exactly in the Quran or in the Sunnah that this is frowned upon. It, it is a naturally occur, occurring phenomenon. It can occur without even interest rate or anything. It is just accumulation of uh, of a resource and then how you manage uh, different maturities and, and putting you know resources into good use. Uh, my issue here is that once, so even if you have a gold system, uh, if you have a fractional reserve, but then one of the challenges that you can have is that the money supply can also increase and decrease uh, through banking, uh, we call deposit multiplier or just simply credit creation even if you are using gold. So gold by itself is not the full solution. Gold is a part of a, of a system uh, that the system needs to be uh, uh, reformed. So, so let me put it slightly differently. Let's say even if you, uh, you are a strong advocate of gold, once gold is put into a fractional reserve system, uh, financial institutions or let's say call them banks, can still have a strong role in increasing and decreasing money supply. And that leads to changes like leads to inflation. And so the so problem of inflation can still exist under a gold system because we have not also reformed the financial system. Uh, May I uh, make a comment? Yeah, Jazakallah yes. for your excellent uh, analysis. And yes, I agree with all your points that gold cannot be in the uh, current banking system, but the current banking system is uh, predicted to collapse soon, you know, special, especially with the digitalization of the monetary system. And so now is the time to reimagine, uh, reimagine a whole system according to Islam, not according to the Western model. And, and we should be thinking of our own solutions, which is just basically reapplying everything that was done in, in, in Medina Ahl Sunnah. You know, that's where the Muamalat life comes in. And I, I wonder, have you had this discussion with Sheikh Omar? Because I'm sure he could provide you all the details that you're referring to. Maybe I'll put it this way. Uh, I think it's as part of our approach is that if we would have uh, uh, some opportunities to invite people to speak uh, and we engage in, in a conversation. Uh, about it. Uh, so I personally have not talked to Sheikh Omar 
uh, directly, but uh, perhaps if we have an invitation, uh, because this is a very wide, uh, uh, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of people, uh, including those who are in this meeting today, who are strong advocates of the gold uh, standard. Um, and then we can have that in-depth conversation. Uh, but one quick comment back is that as of now, as with my state of knowledge, the the, the Medina society uh, or the beloved Prophet Sallallahu represent a very simple economy. It is much, much simpler than any economy that we, uh, that we are dealing with uh, today. So we have to get inspiration. We learn the principles. We can perspective. But obviously, just like we are dealing with uh, electric cars and computerized systems and artificial intelligence and everything, we cannot potentially go back to a simple uh, mode of transportation and traffic control and so on and so forth in the Medina uh, where people just used like animals or walked uh, everywhere. Uh, just like, just that, like it, there's, it, the principles can the some basic principles can copy? Uh, that's why the, that's the whole idea uh, behind the Maqasid approach. And, and I know you are a follower of the Maqasid Institute. Is that what can we take out of the Medina society to apply today? But it's not exactly the same exact model. Now, one of the things about the Medina society, for example, that quickly even Muslim. Uh, civilization quickly developed out of is that Medina society was using gold coins from the Roman uh, Empire uh, primarily and, and, uh, and marginally from the Persian. Uh, so we are using some other peoples, but they were also uh, uh, Omar al Khattab and considered using uh, the hide of, uh, of camels as a form of currency. This is not a gold system. And Omar al Khattab was considering using that. So he fundamentally did not see that this is wrong or this is there's something haram or there's something wrong to. But then the fiqh of Ma'alat involved in this and uh, the other scholarly Sahaba referred to him like what would be the consequences of using the gold is like maybe people just simply kill animals just to harvest uh, uh, the hide and use it as uh, uh, as uh, currency, as a, you know, uh, and that is hugely problematic. Now, move on in the history. It was not only gold, it was gold and silver. And once you have gold and silver, now we have a huge challenge of relative supply of gold versus silver. Now, we move on in the Muslim history, then we got the whole controversy around what we call Al Fulus. Now, Al Fulus uh, was basically uh, bronze uh, uh, coins, uh, and that created because people needed small change. But always, every time you add a new metal, uh, a new product uh, into, uh, into the system, you, you're basically increasing the complexity of the system. And maybe this is why, because uh, the Muslim civilization of, at the time of Prophet ﷺ is different than the Muslim civilization during the Abbasi Khilafah or the Andalusian. This is a lot more sophisticated you know, uh, you know, systems. So yes, so we have to grow, but that created a huge uh, challenge and that needs, that needed to be managed. But just that, I just want to, okay, here's what I'm trying to achieve here is that number one, uh, gold is just one approach. There is nothing necessarily inherently, as I see it, uh, purely Islamic about it. It is not sacred and on its own. It is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to manage our affairs. Maybe it will be different. Maybe it is in combination of different things. Uh, it just I find it a bit simplistic if we just simply focus on gold because that did not happen during even Medina society. There was not only purely gold system. And soon after that, during the life of, of the Sahaba uh, and Khulfa Rashidun, uh, they were uh, faced complex situations trying to come up with better solutions. And throughout Muslim history, uh, we used many uh, other uh, monetary system, or, or the monetary system uh, became more complex uh, than than that, including uh, including quote, the whole challenge and debate around um, 
بخس النقود which was basically the Khalifa or whatever, the monetary authority decided that uh, we're going to re reduce the amount of gold uh, in a coin. So, so we're talking about a gold system, but in that gold system, the relationship between one piece of gold, let's say call it dinar, but that dinar was a hundred gram and then suddenly the Khalifa needed some money for whatever reason, to build a palace or to build a hospital, and then now made it 99 grand of gold. Okay, so now, so and then that, but that, I mean, and and, and ask people to accept till the gold coin that, so it is, it's called dinar, but now it's gold content dropped. So this, again, complications uh, that arise from, uh, and problems can arise even when you use the gold uh, system. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, this is an important conversation about gold, and inshallah we can have uh, a special conversation and a special forum to comprehensively uh, address uh, the gold uh, standard. Uh, maybe the last question for today, uh, Humair, Humair Abdullah, please. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just want to uh, just uh, contribute here to the point raised by uh, uh, Dr. Zaid Banerji uh, regarding the uh, uh, fractional reserve system. So uh, this is a very important point, which is normally omitted uh, by most of the scholars uh, because uh, this fractional reserve system, this uh, uh, able to create uh, wealth out of nothing and that creates inflation and other problems and issues. So if we just uh, switch the system to a full uh, reserve system uh, and of course uh, we uh, uh, get, uh, get rid of the riba and the interest also out of the system, won't it be uh, uh, more prudent and beneficial uh, if we try and run the system in that uh, manner. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the messages or the main message I would say uh, of my presentation today, uh, and it is related to uh, finding solutions. Uh, you know, we. We are quick to, uh, you know, offer some sort of uh, technical, uh, technical solutions, and uh, you know, this is the, exactly the reason why, why I mentioned the uh, fundamental analysis versus technical analysis in trading. Uh, without really looking at the uh, really fundamental things and uh, building our own uh, this worldview and our own understanding of the Quran and. And not only ours, but also the community, our families, the community. Uh, you know, the more people, if we uh, build this uh, like a critical mass of people uh, with this uh, Quranic worldview, I mean, uh, the people who carry this to the masses, uh, solutions can follow. Uh, can follow. I mean, we can still uh, consider uh, some technical uh, issues. We can still ca consider and talk about. Uh, you, you know, the tools, uh, how to implement uh, like full reserve banking, for example, uh, how to uh, get rid of riba completely and so on. So there are, uh, there are uh, some technical, technical issues. Even, uh, even there are, uh, there is a lot of talk today about the uh, walk of, you know, you uh, build, uh, build the economy, so-called Muslim or Islamic economy uh, based on walk of. Uh, but then we have without really uh, without really that culture, you know, and I want to really uh, stress it, you know, without really the culture of giving, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, until we want we, uh, uh, you know, uh, until we get ready to uh, give, uh, you, you know, give to others, give from what we love. Uh, we cannot give, uh, we cannot get righteousness, we cannot get uh, into this 
high kind of uh, you know society which is uh, ready to build like uh, and uh, you know the research centers but then one thing uh, within within this old paradigm we do have some you know pockets where of development where uh, at least we can see maybe some light uh, maybe temporary temporary light at least uh, you know now uh, may, many of our uh, Muslim uh, brothers and sisters at least in uh, in Malaysia, I mean, uh, you know, they, the uh, political system is trying to uh, use this Makassar Sharia approach in in their religious approaches, in uh, in political, in public policy, and so on. But this is the, I think, the crux of the matter: the building the culture. You know, the building the culture. That's why, uh, well, for example, the Prime Minister of Malaysia he is inviting scholars. You know, he's sitting with the scholars. Uh, all the time. I mean, uh, it's a regular, a regular thing. Uh, so, but uh, you know, discussing very important issues. I, how effective it is, I don't know. Uh, you know, we we cannot uh, we cannot really uh, judge it. But then, at least, uh, there is a need to build this culture of giving. And without that culture of giving, uh, you know, only giving the pocket money uh, for for sadaqa and being happy about it. Uh, it's not going to cut it really, uh, uh, but otherwise, other other ideas on uh, like hundred percent reserve and you know uh, some of the ideas on uh, uh, some technical ideas about gold and others. Yeah. These are uh, important important issues, important questions, but the fundamentals are uh, I think more important than, at this time. That, that's my that's my view. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, dear brother Humair, I know this was uh, this issue was raised in uh, in our chat group in the Islamic Economics and uh, Finance chat group, uh, and it got me thinking. Uh, again, of course, this is uh, something that issue uh, comes uh, uh, a lot. Uh, Harris, and I want to emphasize one thing that. Uh, in this setting, it's probably, um, I want this to be a more serious conversation. So I, I do believe that this can be one of the topics that we dedicate a whole, uh, what do you call it, forum. In a forum, then it's more of a conversation and discussion than just a question answer. Uh, so we can truly give um, advocates of 100% uh, reserve, uh, you know, uh, enough time and space to bring arguments to see how how this works out. Uh, but my quick thing is that under the current situation, under the current system, if you apply to say a country said like we're gonna go with hundred reserve, hundred percent reserve, the immediate consequence is massive contraction uh, of economic uh, activity uh, because money supply would suddenly drop and um, uh, you're going to have uh, a huge drop in economic uh, activities. Uh, so with the drop in supply, then you'll have an uh, increase in prices and, and all like, all like you need to have actually more like a, a deflation. All prices need to half or something like that to adjust downward and prices are sticky. So again, this is all from, I'm answering you from purely uh, uh, neoclassical uh, economic approach and of course with uh, Keynesian uh, and new Keynesian uh, system of analysis uh, just but then how about that as part of a overall system uh, reform so what is the first step to get that one maybe there are some prerequisites before we get to the point of um, uh, of implementing a hundred percent reserve, there are probably some prerequisites uh, before we get to that point. And the other uh, issue is that what is what is exactly that we are trying to uh, resolve here? Is it the problem of inflation? If it is the problem of inflation, then uh, again, the, the challenge with inflation is uh, often, more often than not, it is just uh, out of control. Uh, you know, uh, spending, uh, fiscal spending or uh, relaxed uh, monetary policy, uh, expansionary monetary policy. Uh, so what, if you want to resolve this, given that we are in this system, then you have to address that challenge. And then why the government is doing that, that sometimes we end up with the issue because our taxation system is 
inadequate because there are, you know, the government is corruption. So sometimes the problem is elsewhere. So I'm trying to get to that. The problem is elsewhere. And rather than uh, treat the root, uh, the roots of the problem, we come up with these suggestions that if I am to apply right now, uh, it's just like if you take an addict and stop him from taking uh, from his uh, her addiction, uh, addict on heroin, uh, that person uh, will not just heal. Probably that person would die because of the sudden uh, drop in, in heroin uh, supply uh, to his or her system. The same thing here. If you simply just impose a hundred percent reserve, uh, this would be kind of the immediate uh, impact. Now. Another aspect of this conversation that I would love to delve deeply into, because we mentioned the 100% reserve as a, as a cure for RIVA, but that is not necessarily, at least as far as I can logically try to analyze uh, a model, uh, you can have a, a fractional reserve system with no RIVA based on simply Qarb Hassan. Uh, you see, fractional reserve happens because I, if I'm just a person who people trust their money with me, and and I suddenly I have huge amount of money sitting, and uh, when and when I loan money out or do qalt hasan, that I see that it only becomes some uh, recorded transaction on my book that the money may not necessarily leave my uh, my coffers. And it is still here. So in that case, then this is the birth of, so I can find myself, I can make another loan using the same reserve safely. If I match maturities and this, uh, this is the technical way that the banks uh, kind of deal with the situation. So I can do the whole process with potentially called Hassan uh, process with that riba. And then this process leads to uh, money supply and I end up being kind of increasing money supply. Now, is there something specifically uh, haram and me utilizing uh, supplies, uh, uh, you know, amount of money that I'm sitting in my coffers uh, to do good? So here there is a good intention, but of course we want to know about good intention is not enough. Uh, of course, we have the Shirt Qubul Amal, Sahat Aniyat Wa Sawab, that it needs to have the right intention, it needs to be done in the right uh, manner. Uh, yeah. And we want to understand as a part of a system what does that, uh, what does this approach, what does this operation does to the system. But I just want to emphasize that it is possible to have fractional reserve operation or institutions using fractional reserve without having interest rate. Uh, and what does that mean to this economy that we are trying to imagine? Wallah okay. Like, we, this has uh, been great. Uh, yeah, of course, we can so keep the conversation in the, uh, in the chat groups uh, that we have. I mean, we can quickly put a link if you're not part of the economics and, uh, uh, and uh, reimagine economics and finance community. You can join us uh, in that group. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, but we will put also some stuff that are relevant to this conversation. Uh, uh, again, I'm grateful to everybody who is, uh, uh, who is here. Uh, uh, please uh, forgive our shortcomings. If we said something right, it is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, blessings and guidance. And if we said something wrong, if it's purely from uh, ourselves, uh, please remember us in your du'a. Please keep the Quran Kareem center in, 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 uh, in your life and in our life. Uh, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu always the guide for every, uh, every one of our actions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma sifun. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.